Okay, okay, great. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm Jasleen, one of the fellows, and um, I will be talking about mineralocorticoid receptor antagonism and chronic kidney diseases. I have nothing to disclose. Here's the outline for today's talk. I will talk about aldosterone mineralocorticoid receptors, talk about steroidal and non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonism. Focus, the focus will be on phenerinone, the non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonism for diabetic kidney diseases. Within that, I'll talk about clinical trials, blood pressure effect, hyperkalemia risk, some suggestions in the use in future direction. I do want to say that there is large amount of data on mineralocorticoids and mineralocorticoid receptor antagonism and cardiovascular diseases, but this talk will focus mainly on the kidney disease and kidney effects of uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonism. So bear with me. Before I begin, I just want to share a very simplistic view of aldosterone. Evolutionary, if somebody was running away from a predator and had to hide in a cave, and presumably was injured, volume depleted, and starving, he or she needed mechanisms for survival. And what if there was one hormone that could not only maintain hemodynamic homeostasis, which is maintenance of extracellular fluid volume and blood pressure, but also have a role in wound healing? And hypothetically, aldosterone would fit that category. But too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. Stimuli for aldosterone release, right, angiotensin two, low sodium and high potassium levels in the plasma. They activate mineralocorticoid receptors and assist in hemodynamic regulation by playing a role in electrolyte homeostasis and fluid balance. However, overactivation of mineralocorticoids by various ways, which we will talk about, or chronically elevated levels of aldosterone, they are associated with vascular kidney myocardial fibrosis, which eventually can cause end organ dysfunction and failure. So it's not just the kidneys where the mineralocorticoid receptors are located. This is uh, a list of other places where these receptors can be found. So this goes back to medical school classes of what are mineralocorticoid receptors. So mineralocorticoid receptors are a member of nuclear receptor family of ligand dependent transcription factors that are located intracellularly within the cytoplasm and they bind lipophilic ligands such as aldosterone and cortisol. So they are usually in, in an inactive form when they are complexed with heat shock proteins Upon binding of ligand, they change conformation, they can dimerize and translocate to the nucleus where they bind to the nuclear binding site. Um, and eventually the co-receptors, which can be co-activators or co-repressors will bind and the activated MR thus can act as a transcription factor. And this is how it uh, can control sodium and potassium balance. And as we will learn more about also um, cause a pro fibrotic and pro-inflammatory cytokine um, release. So where in the kidney are the mineralocorticoid receptors located? So traditionally we know about the aldosterone um, sensitive mineralocorticoid receptors in the distal convoluted tubule. So this is a single cell transcriptomics showing the expression of the nuclear receptor 3C2 gene within the different cells of the kidney. Um, and the density of the red dots correlates to the number of um, mineralocorticoid receptors in that part of the kidney. And as we can see, of course, the highest density is in the distal convoluted tubule, but these receptors are seen in um, pretty much um, other cell types within the kidney as well. So what is the role of mineralocorticoid receptors in the kidney? Of course, number one we've been hearing about is the homeostatic regulation through the aldosterone sensitive distal nephron, um, and that is by the regulation of sodium and potassium. The other is the pathologic role uh, that is through the mineralocorticoid receptors present on uh, other cells uh, like the podocytes, the vascular cells, 
And it is through this pathway that there can be inflammation and fibrosis. What is also important to note is that unlike the mineralocorticoid receptors um, in the distal nephron, the, the non-classical cells that have mineralocorticoid receptors, uh, not all of them have 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase um, um, enzyme, which if we remember, this enzyme um, breaks down cortisol into cortisone. Cortisone is not a ligand for mineralocorticoid receptors and thus cannot activate it, but cortisol can. So if these cells, the non-classical cells are lacking 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, then um, they can be activated by cortisol. So there are a number of things that can release cortisol. Thus, even in you know, even um, in states where we don't traditionally think of excess aldosterone, stress itself can also activate mineralocorticoid receptors. So how does the activation of MR lead to inflammation and fibrosis? Um, so the aldosterone mineralocorticoid receptor complex um, can lead to a cascade of signaling that will cause upregulation um, of several um, signaling pathways that cause epithelium to mesenchymal um, tr transition, the growth factors that can be relieved, uh, released, there can be extracellular matrix accumulation, inflammation, proliferation, eventually all of them lead to glomerosclerosis, interstitial fibrosis, and tubular atrophy. So now that we know, um, you know, the role of mineralocorticoid receptors and um, the inflammation and fibrosis that can, they, they're associated with, uh, perhaps uh, it makes sense to use mineralocorticoid antagonism to curb some of these deleterious effects of mineralocorticoids. So three um, generations of mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists are in use now. Uh, spinolactone was first generation, aplerinone second generation, and phenylalanine third generation. So why are spinolactone and aplerinone called steroidal? It's just because they have the steroidal backbone and phenylalanine is non-steroidal because it actually has a dihydropyridine backbone instead of a steroidal backbone. And there are differences in the physiochemical and pharmacokinetic properties between the uh, um, steroidal and non-steroidal uh, MRAs that perhaps um, cause differential um, therapeutic effect. So some of those properties are this uh, mineralocorticoid receptor IC50, which is half maximal inhibitory concentration, which basically means the concentration that needs to be achieved to cause 50% inhibition of the mineralocorticoid receptor. So lower the number just means that you need less of it. So it indicates more potency and high affinity for that receptor. So as you can see, the um, has high affinity for, for the mineralocorticoid receptor. Additionally, um, there, there's difference um, between them in terms of whether they have active metabolites or not. And the binding mode is different. Um, so phenerinone here, it's a pretty bulky molecule. And because of this, when it binds to the mineralocorticoid receptor, it actually causes instability such that the cofactors that we, we talked about when we talked about mineralocorticoid receptors, uh, those cofactors cannot bind. And thus the transcription, um, it, further gene transcription is inhibited. Um, and here we can, you know, like it says, pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic gene expression is less. Uh, additional things, additional differences between this, uh, these classes are the half-lives with phenylalanine having the shortest half-life, about two and a half hours. And uh, importantly, the tissue distribution of, of where the, the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist act Important to note is that phenylalanine has a balanced distribution between kidney and heart, whereas spironolactone and epilanone have more distribution in the kidney as compared to the heart. So here's another way of looking at differences between these classes. Uh, simply, you know, the big thing is that the tissue distribution varies. Um, you know, kidney um, versus heart, 
um, and that uh, there is difference in the binding mode uh, of these various MRAs. And eventually there is difference in how the, there's co-regulation um, once, once the MRA, MR complex actually binds to the nuclear binding site. So what does this mean clinically? So at least from preclinical models, we know that at equinaturetic dose, um, phenerinone has more antifibrotic and anti-inflammatory effects than um, diplerinone. So this is a mouse model of cardiac fibrosis where uh, cardiac fibrosis is induced by isoproteranol. And this blue here represents CD68 um, macrophages, which are, a sub which are a subtype of macrophage, inflammatory macrophages. So here we see that there is less fibrosis with the phenerinone as compared to iplerinone. And um, in another rat model of CKD, um, it has been shown that um, there is more cardiac and kidney protection with phenerinone as compared to plerinone. And this protection was measured um, in terms of uh, biomarkers, albuminuria, weight of the organs, and histological changes um, within those organs. Additionally, um, phenerinone had lower uh, blood pressure effect than a plerinone. So how does it translate to humans? Um, Unfortunately, there are, we haven't had large uh, clinical trials that have looked at um, kidney outcomes with the use of steroidal MRAs, unlike um, non-steroidal MRAs, venerinone, which I will talk about. But from the limited data that we do have of the use of steroidal MRAs in kidney disease, we know that they have antiproteinuric effect there may be a signal towards uh, rate of decline in GFR, um, but whether that's clinically meaningful, we don't know. And we of course know that um, uh, in individuals with mild CKD and resistant hypertension, um, they do have blood pressure lowering effect. Um, these need to be weighed against the risks of hyperkalemia, gynecomastia, and um, may be worse than kidney function. So now that we've talked about uh, mineralocorticoid receptors, um, what they do, what their role is, uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonism, um, in general, the differences between uh, steroidal and non-steroidal um, MRAs. Um, briefly, we've talked about the clinical evidence that we have of use of steroidal MRAs um, for kidney outcomes. So rest of the talk, uh, I'm going to focus on uh, non-steroidal MRAs and that's phenerinone. So um, you're all very familiar with the Delio DKD trial, which was a phase three trial designed to test the hypothesis that phenerinone slows CKD progression and reduces cardiovascular morbidity and mortality among patients with advanced CKD and type 2 diabetes. It's important to note that um, the participants had to be on a maximum to maximally tolerated dose of either um, an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Overall, um, the, the diabetes is pretty well controlled in this population with mean um, A1C of about 7.7 .7 and blood pressure was also pretty well controlled with um, mean systolic blood pressure about 131. Um, the CKD itself, um, there were two criteria for it. One was um, EGFR of 25 to 75 with uh, 300 to 5,000 milligram per gram of albuminuria. And then the second criteria was um, EGFR of 25 to 60 uh, and um, urinal and creatinine ratio of 30 to less than 300 plus diabetic retinopathy. So their primary outcome was a composite of um, 
kidney outcomes and their secondary um, outcome is a composite of cardiovascular outcomes. So after a median follow-up of 2.6 years, there was 18% reduction in the primary um, composite kidney outcome and 14% reduction in the primary um, composite cardiovascular outcome. Uh, we will talk about hyperkalemia in a little bit. So um, Figaro was um, also looking at cardiovascular and kidney outcomes in uh, individuals with type 2 diabetes and CKD, but the difference between Figaro and Fidelio is that the CKD in this group is not as severe as Fidelio, and then the primary outcome and secondary outcome were switched. Um, so again, they had to be on maximal tolerated RAS blockade. Uh, as you can see, um, their EGFR, um, there's, you know, here it's 25 to 75 event, essentially. And for this group, it goes from 25 to 90. Um, and um, um, again, for the first, first category of C, uh, CKD, it was EGFR 25 to 90 with urine albumin creatinine ratio of 30 to uh, less than 300. And for the second category, EGFR greater than 60, but higher um, albuminuria. Their primary um, outcome was a, a composite cardiovascular outcome and secondary outcome was the composite uh, kidney outcome. And after a median follow-up of 3.5 years, there was 13% reduction in the primary cardiovascular um, composite outcome. Um, the kidney outcome, the confidence interval contained the null value, so it was not statistically significant. So Fidelity uh, was a pre-specified meta-analysis combining both the Fidelio and Figaro just to look at um, the, the outcomes with finerenone um, on a wide range of CKD ranging from mild to severe. So in this, um, the cardiovascular outcome was primary and kidney outcome was secondary. And overall it showed 14% reduction in composite cardiovascular outcome and 23% reduction in composite kidney outcome. So talking about the blood pressure effect of finerenone, um, because of the differences um, in the pharmacokinetics of finerenone that we, um, we saw. Um, finerenone essentially has less blood pressure effect um, than um, steroidal MRAs. And in um, Fidelio and Figaro, compared to the placebo, on average systolic blood pressure uh, during follow-up decreased about two to three millimeters of mercury. So hyperkalemia is something definitely think about with this class of medications. Overall, as we can see, there were more hyperkalemic events, uh, both in Fidelio and Figaro in the finerenone group as compared to the placebo group. However, the discontinuation of uh, um, drug, uh, the proportion of individuals in which the drug was discontinued was small, 2.3% um, in finerenone and Fidelio compared to 0.9 in placebo and 1.2 in Figaro finerenone compared to 0.4 uh, with placebo. Uh, interestingly, um, you know, looking at how many of the individuals in the trial ended up on additional potassium lowering agents after the enrollment, um, the individuals in the finerenone arm um, were were more likely to be started on uh, potassium lowering agents. So there was a, an ad hoc analysis of Fidelio um, DKD, just looking at hyperkalemia. And what they saw was that hyperkalemia was um, associated with lower EGFR, um, higher microalbuminuria, uh, more beta blocker use, um, if they had higher baseline serum potassium to begin with, and if they were women, and um, those who uh, were on diuretics um, uh, or an SGL2 inhibitor 
um, they had less increase in serum potassium. So I had briefly alluded to the differences in blood pressure effect of steroidal versus non-steroidal MRAs. Um, there uh, are some older studies um, that have looked at, uh, that have compared finerenone and spironolactone for, prime, for cardiovascular outcomes. Um, and so there's ARTS, um, which looked at finerenone versus spironolactone um, in individuals with heart failure who had mild to moderate CKD. And there was less increase in serum potassium in finerenone group um, uh, compared to spironolactone. There was also less decrease in blood pressure in the finerenone arm. Arts, heart failure, um, these were individuals who um, needed to have um, an encounter for worsening heart failure um, and either have diabetes or CKD. And this looked at finerenone versus plurinone. Um, and the outcome was 30% um, decrease in anti-pro BNP, essentially. Um, but within that, there were similar increases in both groups um, as far as serum potassium goes, and really uh, didn't uh, notice any difference between blood pressure. Um, there is another non-steroidal um, MRA exacer known. Um, so there is an excess hypertension study. It's primarily Japanese patients with hypertension. Um, and here, um, uh, it was, ex sorry, uh, the, the comparator was a plurinone. And uh, they saw mild increase in serum potassium with both. Um, but um, exerinone had greater blood pressure lowering effect um, than um, plurinone. What is challenging with this study is that uh, we, there's, the, the authors have not provided information on any additional hypertension agents um, if, if the individuals were on any additional hypertensive agents. Unlike, unlike Fidelio, Figaro, and ARTS and ARTS HF, where um, the individuals had to be on a RAS blockade. So what are the recommendations for use and monitoring of finerenone? Big thing to know is that um, know what their EGFR is prior to initiation and um, um, subsequent monitoring and know what their serum potassium is. Because the recommendations are uh, initial uh, daily dose of 20 milligrams if their EGFR is um, greater than 60. And um, depending on what their serum potassium is, you may have to go down to 10 milligram if their serum potassium is between 4.8 to 5. And um, if their EGFR is between 25 and 60, starting dose is 10, of course, look at their serum potassium and um, um, don't start it if the EGFR is less than 25, just because it's not been studied. Um, and monitor their, um, so monitor potassium and EGFR at baseline and at four weeks after initiation of the dose. And um, then this is available through the FDA label. Um, and depending on a reduction in EGFR and what their serum potassium does, um, there are recommendations on when to lower the dose and when to withhold it and when to restart it. So who is the right patient? for initiating finerenone. Uh, of course, um, they need to have CKD with EGFR of at least 25 type two diabetes. Um, we need to be mindful of what their serum potassium is and not initiate it. In, um, uh, so serum potassium has to be less than um, 4.8 for starting a dose of 20 milligrams and between 4.8 and five for starting a 10 milligram dose. Um, and if they have albuminuria, despite maximally tolerated RAS blockade. The question though is, with the SGLT2 inhibitors, um, you know, do you start finerenone before or after the SGLT2 inhibitors? And this still remains unknown. Um, I will, um, th there, there is a clinical trial that they're recruiting patients for phase two trial uh, called CONFIDENCE. 
where they are going to compare uh, phenetronone with an SGL2 inhibitor. Um, but there are no guidelines right now as to what to do. Um, what I can say is that um, if we're worried about hyperkalemia as an adverse effect of phenetronone, and we know from the ad hoc analyses, granted only 4.8% of the patients in Fidelio were on SGL2 inhibitor, we do know that those on SGL2 inhibitor had lower risk of hyperkalemia. So that would be helpful. Um, other thing is, you know, although SGL2 inhibitors have, they don't have robust effect on decreasing hemoglobin A1C, it's anywhere from 0.6 to 1.2%. But if that's an additional benefit you're considering, then perhaps um, start an SGL2 inhibitor first and then eventually add phenerinone. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, there are no strict guidelines yet. Uh, what we do know from an animal model of hypertension is that there does seem to be an additive effect of uh, phenerinone and ampagliflozin on both cardiovascular and kidney outcomes. So what is in the pipeline? So I briefly talked about confidence, um, which we'll be looking at uh, phenerinone and ampagliflozin in adults with CKD and type 2 diabetes. Uh, they should have started recruiting patients actually on April 15. Um, then there's fine CKD, which is looking at phenerinone and non-diabetic CKD in adults. Um, there is a trial for phenerinone use in children and then phenerinone and half path. So these are the take home points. Uh, we, we talked about, um, you know, even though there are hemodynamic good things about aldosterone, but then we also have to be mindful of the inflammatory and fibrotic effects. Um, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonism offers cardiovascular and kidney protection, and the receptors are located on several other cells um, besides just the distal nephron. And um, we talked about the genomic effects um, of mineralocorticoid receptor antagonism and at equinaturatic dose, non steroidal MRAs, um, at least in animal models, have. Um, more anti-inflammatory and antifibrotic effect. Um, and they have less hypertensive effect. And the hyperkalemia risk is maybe lower with the non-steroidal MRAs. And then be mindful of the right patient, monitoring their serum potassium and dose adjustment. And um, the combination with SGL2 inhibitor and phenetanone, it's uh, to be continued. So, um, thank you to Dr. Tuttle, Dr. DeBoer, um, Dr. Bounsall for helping me through uh, with this, my research mentoring committee, KRI, and entire division of nephrology. With that, I will take questions. Thank you so much, Neha. Questions for, excuse me, Jasleen, uh, questions for Jasleen? Dr. Tuttle. Well, I was clapping for her, <laughs> but I guess I can take that as a hand up. Jesleen, I think you did a fabulous job of really linking the biology to translating it to a therapy. And um, I think that that's really important, especially when we don't have trial data yet on um, thinking about mechanisms when, when, when we want to introduce these therapies, like you pointed out, the issues with hyperkalemia and the emerging data that the SGLT2 combination might not only increase efficacy, but safety so that we can actually apply these therapies. And so, um, you know, I, I think that that's um, a really important point and understanding the mechanisms helps us then apply those therapies uh, in ways that um, are safe and effective for people. So um, you did a great job. Jasleen, I have a, a question. You know, I, I've been thinking about these medications and, you know, I think the real question in my mind is, do we really know that phenerinone is better than spironolactone or plerinone for these indications? And the issue, of course, is that um, Medicare prescription drug plans don't actually cover phenerinone right now. Uh, Medicaid does, um, but if you were to pay out of pocket, it costs $20 a day uh, to take phenerinone. 
right? So it's $600 a month uh, and Medicare won't pay for it. Okay. So um, I'm aware really of just that one trial that you mentioned that included patients with chronic kidney disease that showed that there may be a lower hyperkalemia risk. And there was only 600 patients in the trial. It was a phase two trial, obviously. So, you know, when I'm looking at my patients at Harborview, you know, can I reasonably tell them that I think this medication is better for you than one of the, you know, pennies per day uh, currently available MRAs? So I'm just curious what your thoughts are about that. Thank you for the question, Matt. Um, so, it, unfortunately, of course, nobody has really looked at, uh, you know, outcomes like progression to end stage kidney disease or um, decrease in EGFR uh, with the use of steroidal MRAs. So it's hard to say, um, you know, how their trajectory of kidney disease progression that way will change. But we do know that um, uh, spironolactone and plurinone, they do reduce microalbuminuria. Um, so, and the hope is that if they have less microalbuminuria, they'll have slower progression of kidney disease. So in an event where there are, we're, we're struggling for other alternatives, um, we have them all, all the right therapies. And if the uh, cost of the drug is an issue, and if we're not worried about side effects of hyperkalemia or gynecomastia, um, then I would, I'd rather have them on some aldosterone antagonist than not. At least, you know, we know that it does reduce albuminuria. I, um, Dr. DeBoer, Dr. Tuttle, um, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts. I see Dr. DeBoer with his hand up, so. Yeah, I, I, uh, Matt, I've thought about your question a lot as well. And then I have a, a question for Jasleen too, but I wanted to give my comments. So I think that really spironolactone and plurinone have different indications. Um, and, uh, you know, spironolactone we use for primary hyperaldosteronism. Um, it's used a lot for HEFREF now as part of one, one pillar of HEFREF care. Uh, and I use it a lot for resistant hypertension, this pork line blood pressure drug. Uh, and I, I wouldn't use finerenone for, for any of those things, nor would I use spironolactone as an, an adjunct therapy to prevent CKD progression. I'm not doing it now. I haven't been doing it for years. I'd only do it for one of those other indications. So I think they have, they have based on the clinical data, they have different indications. There are, of course, lots of people who have an overlap of those indications, uh, HEFREF or resistant hypertension and a risk of kidney disease progression. And then you have to choose one. Uh, and the financial considerations probably would weigh pretty large in my mind in that. So that, that, that's how I'm thinking about it right now. Um, I, I wanted to ask Jasleen too about, you know, given you, 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 I think you're right that this combination of SGLT2 and Fernarinone is one of the big questions. They have similar indications, right? Most people who um, were included in, in fact, all people, I suppose, in Fidelio or, or Figaro, um, uh, would today have an indication for an SGLT2 inhibitor um, as well. So I'm curious how you're going to think about this with, with your patients and people who have albuminuric, you know, CKD and, and type 2 diabetes. What, what's your approach going to be? And Kathy and I will listen because we're trying to write the guidelines on this, on this right now. <laughs> yes, tell us, Jasmine. <laughs> we need to know what to write. <laughs> um, so... So, you know, they were, both of them were approved by FDA like months apart for the indication of uh, uh, CKD. Um, what I would, I think we still have to see if they have um, additive effects together, which means, you know, starting them together at the same time or starting one, um, seeing the response to that and then starting another agent. And I'm just thinking it in terms of how patients are going to perceive the pill burden. Um, of, you know, of course they have to be on RAS blockade and then they have to be an SGL inhibitor. And then if I'm going to start finerenone or, you know, finerenone first and SGL inhibitor. Um, and, you know, thinking about the cost of these drugs. Um, 
you know, of course, in an ideal world, I would like to have all of them and all three drugs um, so that I have to dialyze less patients long term. Um, but I, I don't have the right answer, correct answer. Well, and, and you know, I just add, this is a rapidly moving field and I don't think anyone has the answers. We're all thinking about it and, and speculating. And, and I will just mention with regard to a player and I think it was two days ago online and Jason Hitto published another paper looking at SGLT2 with a plarinone and actually the combination in, I think it was people with diabetes and macroalbuminuria together lowered albuminuria like by 60%. And we know that's our best, you know, indicator of a future event. Now it's not an outcome driven study, but back to Matt's question, you know, I, it's gonna be hard to find sponsorship for the, um, the generic mineralocorticoid antagonist, but to be honest with you, the smaller studies that have been done look like things are going the right way too. So I think that's where clinicians are going to have to make a decision about, you know, what do you have available? What's the best evidence? And, you know, in your particular situation, how can you customize therapy uh, for patients? And, and we do have limitations, you know, there, you, you, you mentioned a, a Plarinone, yeah, it's about $600 a month. So it's an SGLT2 inhibitor and a GLP-1 is twice that much money retail price at the drugstore. And, you know, even in people who do have insurance or commercial insurance, oftentimes the co-pays are still several hundred dollars a month for all of these medicines. So we are going to have to make some, you know, decisions based on practicality as well as on evidence. Well, thanks to, to everyone for a robust discussion. Um, we could certainly go on, but we're already late to get to Dr. Bonsall.